Go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 78. We're going to jump right into Psalm chapter 78 because the chapter itself is 75 verses long, and I would like to get you guys out before 6 p.m. tonight. So, Psalm chapter 78. Just kidding, we're only on the first eight verses. That was the best joke I could come up with to open this. I told my wife this morning, I was thinking about, for Father's Day, using a, a dad joke. And I decided not to because I figured, you know, me and Stuart might be the only two that laugh. And my wife looked at me and said, thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks for the support. <laughs> Psalm chapter 78. Psalm 78. The Bible says, Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which, have, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. For He has established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to your word, we open to the 78th Psalm, we open the text where you talk about, where you command your people, where you say to incline our ears, and we talk about telling the next generation the glorious deeds of our Lord. Father, I pray that you would take this word and you would apply it to our hearts, you would apply it to the hearts of fathers in the room, and that you would convict us where we need conviction and encourage us where we need encouragement. In your heavenly name, amen. I want you to real quick envision before you, in your mind, picture three portraits, three pictures hanging on the wall, okay? Three pictures hanging on the wall. Use your mind's eye, use your imagination. Picture three portraits hanging on the wall. Three pictures of three men, okay? You got that image in your mind. The first portrait on the far left is a, very, is a picture of a very distinguished elderly gentleman, a grandfather. The second picture, the one in the middle, in the center, we see another man. We see a, a middle-aged man who bears a family resemblance to the man in the first picture on the left. And then on the far right, we finally see the third picture to the far right, a young man in his early 20s who looks as much like the picture in the middle as the picture in the middle looks like the first picture we referenced. Obviously, you see what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a grandfather, a father, and a son. I'm talking about a family. They, they, they look like a family. You can see it in them. You probably see what I'm saying. You, you see what I'm describing. It should, should fit. But now I want you to picture, though, three corresponding scenes of life with those pictures. I'm going to describe them to you. I want you to picture this in your mind, uh, a corresponding scene to each picture we've, we've mentioned. The first scene I want you to envision takes place many, many, many years ago. We see this grandfatherly figure, the, the very first picture, a middle-aged man himself raising a small boy. We see that the two of them are sitting at the table, and the father is reading the Bible to his son. He's, uh, he's asking him the questions of the catechism. He's reading to him, explaining him the confession of faith, explaining to him what Christians believe. He's praying with them. He is trying to teach him the gospel. He's trying to teach them that life without Christ is not a life that's worth living. He's explaining to him the confession of the faith. He's telling him about the gospel. He is raising his son to be a good man, a man who honors the law and who does not bring shame to his family. He wants his son to grow up and to, live, and to not live a life of immorality, but to live a good life based on the foundation of Christ, based on the word of God, based on the law of God. That's the first scene, the father training his son in the scriptures, training his son in the gospel, training his son in what we believe as Christians. The second scene isn't so happy. This son, the one in the second picture, despite all of his training, was a rebellious son. He grows up, he goes off to college, and he gets all these new ideas about humankind, all these new ideas about the, the nature of the world, and all these new ideas about Jesus and the Bible, and all these new ideas about the world around him. He's no longer, he, his father has taught him what the Bible says. He now has went to college and he has the idea that Jesus was a revolutionary. All right, Jesus is not what he's heard in the scriptures. He's learned something new about this Christ. And he doesn't embrace Christ as, as Savior. 
He doesn't embrace the confession of faith. He doesn't believe what his father has taught him. Nevertheless, though, this young man, now himself a father down the road, is raising his own son, is raising a small boy himself. We look at the dinner table, we look at the table that we had in the first, the first image, and we don't see the Bible being read. We don't see prayers being offered to God. We don't see catechisms being asked. We don't see the confession of faith being explained. We don't see doctrine being taught. But we do still see teaching, though. We do still see some sort of teaching, an interesting teaching. See, despite not embracing the Christ of Scripture, this young man, this, this now father, still wants his son to grow up to be a good man. He still wants that. So he teaches him to love his neighbor, to not bring shame on his family, to be self-controlled, that it's wrong to steal. He teaches him all the ethics that we want, all these good standards, but not with the Bible. No, he teaches his son to love his neighbor without using the Scriptures as his foundation. That's the second scene. The final scene in this illustration, though, is even more bothersome than the second. We now see this grandson, the third picture on the wall, the final picture on the wall. And we see that he's an adult now. He's a grown man himself. And he is living an absolutely wicked life with no self-restraint, no respect for others, only thinking about himself and his own desires. He has no commitment to his marital vows. He does not care if he's bringing shame on his family. He does what is right in his own eyes, without thought of anyone else, without thought of his creator at all. What happened? In three generations' time, in three generations' time, the foundation is already gone. What happened? I think this illustration is a fitting demonstration of where we are in a society and where we have come from. There was a time not that long ago, not that long ago, some of you older brothers and sisters in the room remember when the idea of two men being in an intimate relationship with each other was something that you didn't even speak of. It was unheard of. What? That's horrible. There was a time when you didn't even hear about this, but now it's flaunted and celebrated with its own month dedicated to this perversity. There was a time when just about everyone you knew was a Christian and attended church on Sunday morning. Statistically now, we know that's not the case at all. Statistically, the church is declining at a rapid, rapid rate. It's not the case anymore. Some of you likely remember a time when a woman wearing anything that was more than just above the kneecap was scandalous. Now you turn on TV, though, and you're bombarded with all sorts of adulterous women who have no respect for themselves. <laughs> this is a funny one, actually. If you remember the Beatles, one of the reasons the Beatles were somewhat controversial is because they were young men with long hair. Now men go out in public in dresses and makeup, and it's accepted. What's happened? What has happened? What happened was is that we took our eyes off the foundation and the source for directing the lives of our children. We took our eyes off the Word of God. What happened was that we forsook a generation. We forsook a long-term generational view of our faith. We no longer began to view our children as long-term Christians and warriors in the kingdom of God. Instead, we began to raise them in a way that we have to make sure they vote Republican. We have to make sure they believe the right things about politics. We have to make sure they go to the right schools and they get the right job and they make the right money and they meet the right spouse. We did all of that, though, without remembering the foundation for all these things is found in the Word of God. We sought to have a Christian ethic for our children without basing it on this book alone. We told them, thou shalt not lie. Why? Because mommy and daddy said no. Not because the Bible says so. What happened? What happened was that we wanted the ethics and the results of a Christian culture, but not the book and the Christ that it rests on. Look around us, brothers and sisters. Look around the world we live in. Our culture kills babies in the womb and celebrates that. Our nation celebrates promiscuity and adultery. We blaspheme God in his institution of marriage. We have no regard for human life in any area of life any longer. By all accounts, this culture, by all accounts, the world around us is ripe for destruction. By all accounts, we are headed for judgment. By every measurable standard, this is bad. But Jesus is still king. We are still salt. 
we are still the light of the world. The mission is still to go into the darkness and declare that light has come. The goal is still to disciple all the nations and teach them to obey the law of God. But where does that start? That's still the mission. We're in the darkness. We're in the stronghold of the kingdom of darkness. But where does the mission start? How do we begin? Where do you begin? Where do I begin this mission? Where do we begin? I don't usually give titles to my sermons. I get made fun of for this often. I'm not creative enough to come up with these things. But it just felt right to call this a strategy for victory. The scriptures give us a strategy of, of what we do in a situation like this. What do we do in a time like we're in now? The scriptures give us an answer to this. And it begins first on Father's Day because it begins first with fathers as the head of their home. It begins first with covenant heads doing what God has commanded them to do. So while this message is directed to everyone in this room, obviously, fathers, I'm talking specifically to you. The text is going to speak specifically to you, Dad. We're going to look at the major themes in this text. I'm not going to preach this like we usually do. We're not going to walk verse by verse through. We're going to look at the major themes of this text, and we're going to see what they mean for our lives today. So before we dive into the themes of the psalm, I want to look real quick at verse 1. Psalm 78, verse 1. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. The very first thing we must do today and every day is to listen to the instruction of the Lord, to incline our ears to the words of his mouth. That's the first thing that we have to do. It isn't by accident that the psalm opens with this. As we already read, the whole psalm is about telling the next generation the things of the Lord. The whole psalm is about telling your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren's children's children all the way down the line what the Lord has done and what he has done for your life and what he will do for their lives. Hear this. In order to do that, in order to tell the next generation the things of the Lord, you first must listen to what the Lord has said. You first have to open this book and listen to what the Lord has said. We cannot faithfully teach our children about the Lord unless we first sit down, be quiet, and listen to the words of God. Oh, how we have tried for so long to do what God has commanded us to do without listening to the words God has given us to do it. We've tried far too long to do this in our own strength. I want to teach my children the Ten Commandments. I want to teach them to love the Lord. I want to teach them to read their Bibles. Dad, are you reading your Bible? Are you loving the Ten Commandments? Are you worshiping the Lord? We want to teach them to do it, and we must first do it ourselves. We're the heads of households. We are the leaders of our homes, and yet we never step forward and listen to the one who has made us head of the household and who all responsibility belongs to, all lordship belongs to, King Jesus. Let me be clear, if you want to be a good leader of your home, if you want your children and your wife to learn from you, to learn about the Lord, if you want your children and your wife to learn the words of God, then you must first become a student of the Lord yourself. Amen. You must first study the Lord yourself. You must submit privately, day in and day out, to the study of His Word. You must seek to submit yourself weekly to the preaching of the Word, and to the community of the church, and to the leadership of elders. Do you want your children to grow up and learn to submit to the Lord then demonstrate what that looks like for them in your own life? Amen. So let's look at the text now. Psalm 78, verses 2 through 8 is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. The very first theme that we see in this text, the very first theme is the strategy. I said to you a minute ago that there has to be a strategy. What do we do in this situation? What do we do in, in a situation where it looks like we're losing, where we've already lost the war? What's the strategy from here? The strategy is a multi-generational view, a multi-generational view of, of uh, our faith, a multi-generational view. Look at the text for just a second. The, the idea of telling the next generation is mentioned six times, six times in eight verses, six times in eight verses. Verse three, we were told by our fathers, which we have heard and known um, and our fathers have told us. Verse 4, we will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord 
Then we go on to verse 5. We are commanded, uh, fathers are commanded to teach their children. Verse 6, to the generation not yet born. And also in verse 6, so that they may tell it to the next generation. Six times in eight verses, we are told to tell our children so our children may tell their children. A generational view is, in, is what happens. A generational view is the strategy here. We have to think long term about our children. We have to think long term about our family. We have to think long term about our faith in relation to it. Three of those six times, by the way, you notice the word father is used. That's who we're addressing. That's who the psalmist is addressing here. The fathers, the heads of household. It's very simple. You have to tell your children and your children's children about the Lord. It's not the church's job to do that. It's not the church's job to do that. It's not the youth pastor's job to do that. It's not the school's job to do that. It's your job, primarily fathers. Mothers, you're included in this as well, to be clear, but primarily the text is talking to fathers. It's your job to talk to your children about the Lord. The impetus, the responsibility, men, is on you to raise your children in the fear of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your, uh, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What's this text telling us? Every single aspect of raising our children, every single aspect of training our children must be in light of the Lord God is one and the Lord God has commanded us how to live. The law of God must be the lens by which we view our children. It must be the lens by which we view the children that we have not even had yet. Every aspect of their life, every step of their day from the time they get up in the morning to they're eating their breakfast, till they're going to lunch, till they're eating dinner, till they're going to bed, should be in view of Jesus is Lord and he has commanded us to live a certain way. It should be in light of God's law. That's what Deuteronomy 6 tells us. Notice also, though, in the text... Back in Psalm 78, uh, we have, Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. Verse 4, we will not conceal them from their children. We will not conceal them from our children. What are some ways that we conceal the word of God? What are some ways that we conceal what God has said and what his works are to our children? Well, I thought about this for a little bit this week, and <laughs> quite simply, the most common way of all, we just don't do it. We just don't do it. We simply don't tell them. This is probably the most common form of concealing the words of God from your children. Just simply not telling them. Why should we tell them? I take them to church every Sunday. They hear the preacher talk about the Bible. They go to the youth group on Wednesday night. They hear the youth pastor explain this to them. Why should I have to tell them? Because it's your duty. God has commanded it to you. You're responsible for the outcome of that child. You will give an answer. You will give an account for those children in your home. First and foremost, we just don't tell them. Let me be clear. If you do not teach your children what to believe, if you do not teach them how to think, if you do not teach them what to believe about God and the world around them, let me make you a promise. The world will. Someone else will tell them. Someone else will. We have statistically, we have children growing up and going to college and leaving the faith never to come back more often than not. I believe the statistic last I checked was around 60%. Well, let's take a poll of how many homes are training their children in the law of God. Well, maybe that's why they left, because they didn't know it to begin with. Think about this for a moment. How many hours have you spent teaching your kid to keep the, his eye on the ball? How much money and time have you spent taking your daughter to dance uh, lessons and to ballet? And how much time have you spent teaching them to pray and read the Bible and explain it to them? That's convicting. When you, when you think about that, that's convicting. How many hours have you spent devoted to their spiritual maturity? The text continues. We, another, or another way, I'm sorry, another way that we, we don't tell the next generation, another way that we conceal this from the next generation is that we live a life that doesn't represent what we believe. Oh, that's a big one, right? We come to church, we sing the psalms, we raise our hands in, in, in worship, we pray. We may teach a Sunday school class. We're committed to the church. We have a faith. The, 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 the world around us knows us as a Christian. 
And then when we go home, though, it's a whole different person. You want to conceal the truth from your children? Then live a double life. Teach them to lie to the world around them by being someone different at home than you are in the world. That's how we conceal the truth from our children. We tell them, thou shalt not lie, and to love their neighbor. And then what do we do? In front of them at home, we lie, we mock our neighbors, and we ridicule those that we dislike. Thirdly, why, why, thirdly, why is this generational view a problem? Why is it hard to have a multi-generational view? Thirdly, we don't have a long-term plan. Let's be honest about that for a minute. We don't have a long-term plan. We are a short-sighted people. All right, we don't think about children until our children come. Or I'm sorry, we don't think about children until we have the pregnancy test that says, "Hey, you're having a baby." <laughs> we don't think about grandchildren until our children come to us and say, "Hey, mom, dad, I'm pregnant." We don't have a long-term view. We are short-sighted. I know what's going on. I might get in trouble for saying this. I know what's going on. Why well, think long-term? We're just waiting on a rapture. I'm going to worry about generations from now. I don't got to worry about what's coming down the road. I don't need to plan for the future. Look around you. The world's already, already destroyed as it is. The Lord said it's going to get worse. Why should we think long-term about it? That's foolishness, friends. That's foolishness. We don't think long-term about our children. We don't believe God's promises. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay. Is it on? Okay. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart depart from it. Now I know what happens. I quote that text. I mention that text. And the first thing that comes to our minds, the first thing we think of is I'll do my best, but it's their decision when they get older. Or we may raise kids and they may, may never become Christians. That's the first thing we think of. And you know what that does? You know what that proves when we, when we do that? It proves we don't believe the text to begin with. If I read to you a verse from scripture and your first thought is how that scripture is not always true, then you're not believing it to begin with. And then what happens? A cycle is created where you're not believing the scripture in the first place, and then your child grows up and doesn't believe the scripture either. This is awkward to hold. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We have to have a long-term view of our children. We don't tend to see children this way. We don't tend to have a multi-generational view. We don't look at our little ones and think long-term. We don't look at our children and think about their grandchildren. That's not ever in view. No, what's in view is what's right in front of me today. We don't look at our sons as soldiers and our daughters as homemakers for the kingdom. We don't view them that way. Example of this uh, that came to my mind this week. I'm not raising my son to swing the, the, I'm not raising my son Zeke to swing the bat well. I'm not. I'm raising him to be a father. I'm raising them, him to be a husband. I'm raising him to be a conqueror for the kingdom of light. I'm raising him to go into the darkness and declare that Jesus is king. I look at this two-year-old boy, and I'm not looking at him as I'm training you to be a boy. No, son, I'm looking at you today for what you will become one day for the man that you need to be to continue this war long after I'm gone. We must see our children in light of the mission of God. Why do your children exist? Why do your children exist? It's a simple answer. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The same reason you exist as well. We have to view our children in light of that. The vision we must have, sitting at the head of the table, looking over three generations of faithful Christians because the Lord is faithful and we are obedient to tell the next generation. That's the vision you have to have, mom and dad. That's the vision, dad, you specifically have to have. Grandfathers, that's the vision you have to have. I want one day to sit at the head of the table with my wife, my wife sitting at the right, looking over 25 people, all descendants of us, all telling stories about what the Lord has done in their lives, all telling stories about what they have done for the kingdom. That's the vision that I want. I want to be an old man that hears stories of my, my sons and my grandsons, not just as athletes or businessmen, but as men who have made war for the kingdom of Christ. I want to hear their stories about 
Do you remember the day I stood up at the city council and opposed what was happening in our city on the law of God? I want to hear stories like that. I want to hear stories from my daughters and my granddaughters about being homemakers and raising covenant children and creating a culture that can't be found anywhere else but in the home that God has ordained it to be. That's the long-term view. That's the vision of multi-generations. I want to listen to my daughters and my granddaughters tell stories of these things. We must have a generational view. God, let me tell you something. Guys, I say this, and I get some strange looks in the, in, in the congregation. We must have a multi-generational view. Listen, God has always been multi-generational. That's not new, all right? And I'll be up front, the Baptists haven't done well with this doctrine. But God has always been multi-generational. God's promise to Abram was what? Your descendants will be like the sand on the sea, like the stars in the sky. Those will be your descendants, Abram. Not you, Abram. Not the one son I'm going to give you, your descendants. The whole household that comes from Abraham. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we already read that. But verse 7 follows it. It's about looking down the line. It's about the generations to come. God has always dealt with his people covenantally. God has always dealt with his people generationally. Make no mistake, your children are covenant children that God has a plan and a purpose for. They're not just here to be cute. They're not just here to make you laugh. They're not just here to make you smile. They're not just here to give you hard days sometimes. No, they are here because they are covenant children. They're the children of believers, and they are here to make a war long after you're gone. See, your duty as fathers, your duty as moms, is to look at the world around you and say, I am here to declare the kingship of Christ in all nations. I am to disciple all nations to obey Jesus, and I'm not going to live long enough to do that. I'm preparing them to continue that war after I'm gone. That's how we view our children, and that's how God has always viewed our families. Um, I'm about to say something um, that's going to get me into controversial territory, but those of you that know me know I have a vacation home there. 1 Corinthians 7.14 says that the children of believers are considered holy. The children of believers are considered holy. And we can wrestle all day about what that actually means and what that entails. But let me ask you real quick, just taking the text at face value. Mom, Dad, is that how you view your kids? Do you view them as, as holy before the Lord? We have to look at our little ones as set apart from the world for a purpose. And what is that purpose? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever by declaring the Lordship of Christ over all the earth. We view our little ones as holy before the Lord. But what do we tell them? Let's continue back in Psalm 78. What do we tell them? I'm telling you that your job is to tell the next generation the things of the Lord. I'm telling you that your job is to tell them what the book says. I'm telling you your job is to disciple them and train them to continue the war. But what do you tell them? What's the message that you give them? Is it just simply repent and believe? Or is there more to it than just that? Let's go back to the text. Psalm 78 verse 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Parables. When we hear this word, we immediately think of, of the stories, the parables of Christ. And while that is most certainly in view here, that's most certainly true, uh, the word here could better be understood as Proverbs. The sayings of Ecclesiastes, or Psalms, or the book of Proverbs, or Song of Solomon. The idea here is quick communication of a simple truth in a memorable way. I remember when I was growing up, my mother had a parable. It was, it was from 1 Corinthians, actually. My mother would always tell me, especially in high school, uh, bad company corrupts good character. It's a quick little quote. It's a quick little, it's a quick little text from the Bible. But what does it do? It resonates. It carries a place in your mind that you're not just going to get rid of. That's an earworm. You're not just going to forget that when it's convenient. The, the phrase employed here, here uh, by the psalmist, parable in dark sayings, in the original language, conveyed the idea of grave, striking Proverbs. They were intended to challenge the mind, uh, sayings that were crafted to puncture the conscience or, or bludgeon the unmoved heart. Statements that in our culture, quite frankly, would, we, most of us would consider offensive. That we would leave a church if they dare said these things to us. Statements such as in Proverbs, he who, despise, he who despises discipline is stupid. It's a proverb in, the, in, the, in, the, in our Bible. And yet that's what he's talking about here. The psalmist uh, will utter dark sayings from of old. Again, this is a reference to a teaching method of things that are hard 
are hard things, things that are hard to understand, things that prick the conscience and provoke the mind. This is something that we need to highlight in our Bible. We need to speak of the hard things, the dark things of our faith. Let me be more direct. The context is speaking of telling our children the dark sayings of old. Friends, do you tell your children what the Lord has done? Do you tell him all he has done? Even the parts that may be hard to understand or that we may not like telling them. We must be faithful to proclaim in our homes all that the Lord has done. We must be faithful, intentional to tell our children everything, everything God has done. The text says dark sayings of old, things that are hard to understand, hard sayings. Let me ask you, are you telling your children the things that are hard to tell them? I could spend all day talking about this right here. But part, part of telling our children the hard things about God means telling them the truth as it is, with all the rough edges, with all the corners, with all the blood, with all the gore, with all the pain, with all that comes with it, as it was told in our Bibles. We try to sand down these edges in the stories of God, okay? We try to, we try to make them safe and tolerable so all the kids can hear them and love the stories. We have, I want to step on some toes, we have talking fruits and vegetables, doing funny cartoons about biblical stories. Why? Because it's easier to present our kids the nice story of David and Goliath than to tell our kids that David knocked down Goliath and cut his head off and then carried it around like a purse. By the way, your sons would love to hear that part of it. It's in their nature. There's a reason it's in their nature. <laughs> it's easier to present a cartoon of Noah with all these cute little animals on the boat smiling for a picture and ignore the fact that floating beneath them is hordes of dead bodies that the Lord has killed for not believing in Him. It's easier to do these things. Or how about the stuff we just don't tell them at all, the stories we avoid? We roll through the Old Testament hitting all the high points because we want them to get the story, all the while ignoring in Exodus when, or in, in Deuteronomy when the priests of God are told, draw your sword and slay everyone who's unclean. Or we tell the story of the Exodus and we talk about how God brought his people out of Egypt. Well, let me ask you, do you tell your children what happened when they got to Canaan and God said, go and kill every man, woman, and child and animal and burn down all their holy places? Now, we usually stop where the text is most comfortable for us. We usually sand off those rough edges. The text says, dark sayings of old. Let me tell you, the Lord is a very old God. He's eternal. Okay, His truth is an old truth. This is important right now. This is important. We live in an age where we are constantly, we're constantly pressured to have new ideas about church, new ideas about mankind, new ideas about God and how to worship Him. We must be relevant. We've got to be cutting edge. We need to be hip and cool, which I understand isn't a cool thing to say anymore. We have to be hip and cool. Brothers and sisters, Mark my words, the eternal God has no new truth. There's no new way of worshiping Him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we must be content with that. We must embrace that. New truth is simply old heresy. And when we teach our children this, we don't teach them whatever's new and interesting. We don't teach them what we read out of a pop psychology magazine in the doctor's office. We don't teach them what we see on the counters at Walmart or the Barnes & Noble bookstore. We teach them the truth of old, the traditions. I love that word. We teach them the traditions that have been laid down before us by men who have gone before us, by faithful men and women who have been before us. And guess what? In two to three generations our great-great-grandchildren will be teaching their children what we have laid down before them. It's not new. We teach them the old truths. We teach them the old truths. Most of you know uh, my primary work is in the field of apologetics, and this is just a quick example of this. Anytime I'm discussing a popular issue with somebody and defending the Christian faith, I'll reference a man named Cornelius Van Til. Most of you don't know that. Go Google him. You'll love him. <laughs> I'll reference this man, and the response I'll get from Christians is, well, yeah, that's old arguments. We need new stuff for new people. I'm sorry, did God change his mind? Did God change his word? Has God himself changed? No. Why? Because God is eternal and unchanging, and he has promised he will be so. We will tell our children dark sayings of old. We don't come up with new things to tell them. We don't come up with new, interesting, exciting things. We tell them the already exciting news that God has given us. We tell them the stories that God has already given us. Do you want your children to grow up faithful to their Lord? Then tell them old truths of an eternal God. 
Do you want your kids to go into this world as a soldier for King Jesus? Then ground them in the unchanging, older than time itself truth of the Word of God. Do not flood their minds with new ideas about God. Do not succumb to the temptation to give them something new and exciting. Give them what has lasted centuries. Give them parables and dark sayings of old found in the Scriptures. Verse 4 continues, uh, what do we tell these, this generation? What's the message that we give the next generation? Verse 4, we will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. We tell them what He's done. We tell them what God has already done. We open this book and we read what God did in Genesis and Exodus, even Leviticus, and we tell them what He has done. We tell them about creation. We tell them that God created the world with the word of his mouth in seven days. We tell them about flooding the earth and judgment because the people did not worship him. We tell them about the exodus where God is faithful to hear the words of his people even when they are oppressed, even when they are small in number, even when no one else cares. We tell them about Christ. We tell them about a Jesus who is God in the flesh. Who turned the world upside down, not by living with the status quo, not by living a peaceful, careful, content life, but instead standing on the word of God that was his law that he has given and declaring the truth and then being killed for it and raised from the grave three days later. We tell them what God has already said. That's the message. We tell them what God has done. That's the message you give your children. What else do you tell them? You tell them what God has done for you. Mom, dad, especially dad, you tell your children what God has done for you. Has God saved you? Were you, were you a, a sinner that loved your sin, that lived a wicked and deplorable life that God redeemed and brought into his light? And you tell them about that. See, we're, we're men by nature, we have, we have pride by nature. We don't want to tell our kids what we've done. We've done some bad things, and we don't want to tell our children about that. We've really messed up. We'd rather not think about that. But let me tell you, telling your children the man you were before Christ and the man that Christ has made you now, there's no better way to exalt that king before them. Amen. Tell them what the Lord has done for you. Verse 5, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. What's the message? What are you supposed to tell your children? You're supposed to tell them what he's done for you. You're supposed to tell them the praises and the works of God. What else? You're to tell them his law. You're to tell them his law. Now, I'm not going to get on a rant and go on for the next 45 minutes about this, but we have a poor view of law in the church. We have a very, most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, believe the first half of this book where all the laws are found doesn't really apply to us today. Friend, nothing could be further from the truth. The command is for you to tell your children about the law. And here's the thing. Let's get practical for a minute. Not just when it's convenient for you. Not just when it's convenient for you. You don't tell your child, honor your father and, mo and mother because you're frustrated with them. Not just when it's convenient for you. You don't tell your daughter, thou shalt not lie because she, you believe she's lying about something that's happened in the house. You don't use, let me be, be frank, you do not use the word of God as a weapon to strike your child back into line. Because I promise you if you do, God will use that same weapon on you. You do not use the word of God as a tool to simply whip them back into shape while you live as you choose to live. That's not how the word of God presents these things. You teach them the law. The third theme we see continuing on, what's the goal? What is the goal? So we've established we have to have a multi-generational view. We need to tell our children with a view of our grandchildren, with a view of their grandchildren. That's why we tell them. We've, dis we've established what we tell them. We tell them about God and his works. We tell them what he's done, and we tell them about his law. But what's the goal in this, Frank? What's the goal? Why are we doing it? What's, what's the outcome we're looking for? The goal, friends, is faithfulness. Look at verse 6. That the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. The first goal, verse 6, the very first half of it, that the generation to come might know. What's the goal? The goal is that they would know Jesus. The goal is that they would know the Lord. The goal is they would know Scripture. The goal is that they would know this King. That's the goal. The goal is faithfulness. 
You want your children to remember the things of the Lord. You want your children to teach your grandchildren about the law of God. Then you first have to teach them yourself that they might know. That they might know. Verse 7 continues this though. That they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. What's the goal? The goal is that they have faith in the Lord. The goal is that they keep His commandments. Let me be, let me be clear. It's not just that they grow up and they lead really good lives with really nice families and work hard at their jobs and pay all their bills. That's not the goal. Sure, we want that. Sure, that's, a, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But that's not the goal. That's not the goal. You don't look at your child. Let me be up front. You don't look at your child with the, uh, the attitude that I'm raising you to be a man who gets by, lives a good life, and then goes home to be with the Lord. No, we raise our children with a view in mind, I'm raising you to go out and make war. Because our king has told us that we live in the kingdom of darkness and we are to declare his message to the nations. We don't look at our child and say, how can I prepare you for the world? We look at our child and say, I want to raise you in a way that the world's not prepared for you. That's how we need to view our children. That's the faithfulness. That's the goal. Is that our kids would not be just those that grow up and get by living by the status quo. But that they would grow up and be people that are remembered through history for what they've done. There would be people that have lived lives that generations to come, they're going to tell stories about what great, great, great grandfather did in the name of King Jesus. That starts with you. That starts with you. That starts with down. That starts with right now. Today. Tonight, when you go home, telling your kids what the Lord has done, telling your kids what the scripture says, and the hope and the prayer and the belief that God will be faithful to his promise, and that two, three generations from now, your great-grandkids will say to their children, I believe what I believe because grandpa taught my mom and dad, or your great-grandfather taught my mom and dad what to believe, and they taught me. This is what generational faithfulness looks like, and that's the goal. The goal is that they would keep his commandments. They would be obedient they would abide by what he said. They would do what he has told us to do. They would not do what he's told us not to do. They would obey his commandments. We don't like language like that anymore, but that's what the Bible says, that they would obey his commandments. And what's the end goal that we know about? They would glorify God and enjoy him forever. Think to yourself, do you look at your children that way? I'm serious. As you're frustrated with them right now because this morning they didn't want to get ready for church. <laughs> As you've had an irritating week with them because they have minds of their own and they don't necessarily agree with yours all the time. Do you look at your children, I'm raising you to glorify God and enjoy Him forever? Is that at the forefront of your mind? Is that why you're training them? Is that what you're teaching them? And then finally, we have the warning. Look at verse 8. And not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. That's the warning. That's what happens when we have not done our job as fathers. Your fathers, your failure to proclaim the gospel in your home will lead your child to being stiff-necked towards the commands of the Lord he will be rebellious against God and His law. If our children rebel against God, if they are stubborn and unwilling to submit to His commands, then their souls will be condemned to hell. I'm not sugarcoating it because the stakes are that high. They're that high. It's that important. But we can prevent this. We have a role to play in this. We may today open his word and proclaim his wondrous deeds to them so that they may not rebel against him, that they may instead worship him. Again, this begins with opening the word of God daily in your home. But this also begins with you, fathers, living as a man who submits to God and follows his commands. Hear this, the life you live will be witnessed by your children and they will follow in your footsteps more often than not. Do you want to set the tone for generational faithfulness? Do you want the generations to come after you to worship the Lord? Then you have to start today by doing that very thing. And they're likely to follow your footsteps. That's the way God has designed. But the flip side is true as well. If you live a life of rebellion, if you live a life where you don't submit to the word of God, if you live a life of sinfulness, they're going to follow those footsteps as well. 
They're going to follow those footsteps as well. They're going to do what you have done. We've all seen that in our lives, haven't we? We've all, let's, let's be honest for a minute, we've all seen friends and brothers and sisters and cousins and family members that have lived their life in a way that is not according to God's law, and their children now are doing the exact same thing. Your children will follow in your footsteps. The text says also in verse 8, a stubborn and rebellious generation, un, uh, a generation that is, did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. A spirit who's not faithful to God. Real quick, I want to read the remainder of this text to you. This is the result. This is what happens when, our, when we as fathers are stubborn and rebellious. When we are the generation who does not tell the next generation the things of the Lord. Starting in verse 9. The sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. They forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. He wrought wonders before their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the water stand up like a heap. Then he led them with the cloud by day and all the night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them abundant drink like the ocean depths. He brought forth streams also from the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. God did all this, yet they still continued to sin against him. To rebel against the Most High in the desert, and in their heart they put God to the test by asking for food according to their desire. Then they spoke against God. They said, Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that waters gushed out, and streams were flowing, can, uh, and streams were overflowing. Can he give bread also? Will he provide the meat for his people? Therefore the Lord heard and was full of wrath, and a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also mounted against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he directed the south wind. When he rained meat upon them like dust, even winged fowl like the sand of the seas, then he let them fall in the midst of their camp, round about their dwellings. So they ate and were filled, and their desire he gave to them. Before they had, listen to this, the Lord's been faithful, the Lord's blessed. But that generation, as verse 8 said, did not tell the generation to come. That generation was not faithful, even though the Lord had been blessed, or had blessed them. Even though the Lord had done all these magnificent things. Verse 30, before they had satisfied their desire, while their food was in their mouths, the anger of the Lord rose against them, and killed some of their stoutest ones, and subdued the choice men of Israel. In spite of all this, they sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works. So he brought their days to an end in futility, and their years in sudden terror. Did you catch that? The verse started. The chapter started in verse eight. Do not be like the previous generation. Don't be like them. They didn't tell their children like they were supposed to. They didn't warn them of the things of God. And what happened? Their sons were raised up, and according to the first couple of verses, they were great warriors. Yet they fled in the time of battle. They were cowards. Don't raise your sons to be cowards. They, were, they, were, they fled in the time of battle. They didn't thank the Lord. They didn't worship the Lord. They didn't abide by his commands. And how does the text end in verse 33? He killed them. He took them from the earth. He brought an end to their days. This is similar to the great command and honor your father and mother. We all know that part, honor your father and mother. But what does the rest of it say? Paul says the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? That your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord God gives you. That your days may be prolonged. That your days may be prolonged. Here's, here's what I'm saying to you, friends. If we raise our children to not believe the Lord... If we raise our children to not obey this word, if we raise our children to not submit to God, then he may cut their days short. And it will be our fault. It will be our responsibility because we didn't train them in the way that we were supposed to. We did not lead them in the way we were supposed to. We did not tell them what the Lord God had said. We are responsible to do that. Deuteronomy chapter 6 
It talks about what to do. It talks about, remember we read this earlier, about uh, from the time they wake up to the time they eat to the time they go to bed, all things in light of the law of God and the Lord God being one. What does the text end with, though? You ever, ever notice that? The text ends by saying that the Lord visits the, the iniquity of those who do not believe in him from generation to generation to generation, but shows faithfulness to those who worship and serve him. So what's the promise? I want to end with this. What's the promise? What, what's happening? Here's what's happening. Generational faithfulness is always met by the blessing of God. By the blessing of God. But one generation of unfaithfulness, according to the scriptures, brings on generations of judgment to come. Some of us today are sitting in this room, and where, where we're at right now in life, where we are at in our family tree, we are the first Christians. Some of us are sitting in this room right now, and we, we can be, if we're faithful to his word, if we're faithful to tell the next generation, we can be the, the matriarchies and patriarchies of our family. We can set a new tone for the generations to come. But there's also some of us in this room that don't care to tell our children the truth. We don't, tell to tell our children, we don't care to tell our children what the word says. We don't care to tell our children what God has said. We don't care to tell them about Christ. We live our lives the way we want to, the way we're comfortable with. We don't, we don't really care to repent and put our faith in Christ. We don't care to live a life that God has commanded us to live. And guess what? You're going to set a generational tone as well, where the iniquity of your fathers from generation to generation will continue. That's the way the scriptures present being a father. And that's the message for us on Father's Day. It's not a day to celebrate. It's a day to look internally and say, am I doing what God has commanded me to do? Am I, am I obeying God in his word? Let's pray.